In this video, we're analyzing the motion of a hollow ball that's rolling up a hill, and we're going to use forces and torques to do this. So we've done this problem before by using energy methods, and we were able to answer part B, computing the maximum height of the ball before it turns around. But using force and torque allows us to get into all the details of the motion and answer questions that we can't answer using energy. So I'm able to find the acceleration of the ball at any moment, and in part C, we're able to compute the minimum coefficient of static friction so the ball doesn't slip while it's rolling up the hill. So to start things out, we start diagramming all the forces that are acting on the ball when it's on the hill. And of course, we have gravity pulling straight down with a magnitude of mg. I'm just going to leave that symbolic for the moment. I'm going to put a perpendicular into the graph because we need to decompose the force of gravity into parallel and perpendicular components. And we know from a lot of experience solving problems on ramps that this angle right here between the perpendicular component of gravity and the force of gravity itself. That's the same as the angle of incline for the ramp. And that's shown as 25 degrees in the problem, but for the moment, I'm just going to leave it as a theta. And that perpendicular component has a magnitude of mg cosine theta. There's also a parallel component of gravity pulling down the ramp that has a magnitude of mg sine theta. And then the surface can exert perpendicular and parallel forces. The perpendicular force is the normal force, and that's exerted right at the contact point with the ramp. So there's the normal force, and that must exactly balance the perpendicular component of gravity. So I'm just going to do that calculation within the diagram. N is going to be mg cosine theta. Because the ball has no acceleration perpendicular to the surface. Now the final force that we need to get into the diagram is the friction force, and we need to figure out which way that points. And the clearest way I can make the argument is by looking at the direction of rotation of this ball. It's rolling clockwise and rolling clockwise up the hill. And I know that that rolling is getting slower and slower and slower. So I have to think about which way does friction exert a torque with respect to the center of mass of this ball in order to slow down that rotation. Well, that must be a counterclockwise torque. Friction forces have to act parallel to a surface. So I have a choice here of either pointing it down the ramp or up the ramp. And the direction that gives me a counterclockwise torque is to point that force of friction pointing up the ramp. And this is a static force of friction because there is no slipping between the two surfaces. Okay, then we get into our force and torque analysis. And we've already dealt with the perpendicular direction by computing N. We did that by assuming all the forces in the perpendicular direction balance because there's no acceleration in that direction. What about the parallel forces? Well, I need to define which way I'm going to call positive. And I'm going to call down the ramp the positive direction just because it makes my life a little simpler. I know that acceleration points down the ramp, and if I make that the positive direction, then A is a positive number. And so I apply Newton's law in the parallel direction. So the sum of all the parallel forces will give me mass times the center of mass acceleration in the parallel direction. Well, that's the only component of the acceleration because the perpendicular component vanishes. And my mg sine theta counts as positive because of the way I chose my coordinate system my static friction force points up the ramp. So there's my net force, and that's equal to m times the center of mass acceleration. Then we analyze the torques acting on the ball. And the sum of all the torques with respect to the center of mass is equal to the moment of inertia with respect to the center of mass times the angular acceleration around the center of mass. And if I look at all the forces acting on the ball, there's only one of them that actually exerts torque, and that's the friction force. The force of gravity is attached to the center of mass, Remember, we can compute the torque exerted by gravity by pretending all the mass is concentrated at the center of mass. And I'll post a link to the video where that was derived. But with that force attached right to the center of mass, it means we have a lever arm of zero. So the torque exerted by gravity is zero with respect to that axis. The normal force also exerts zero torque because of the direction it's aimed. It's aimed right through the center of mass. And this means the lever arm and the normal force point in opposite directions. And that means the perpendicular component of the normal force for the purpose of exerting torque is zero. So all we have to write down for the sum of all our torques is the torque exerted by friction. And that's our static friction force through a lever arm of R, the radius of the ball. Then I need to write in the moment of inertia of the ball. And this is a hollow ball. And this is a formula you just have to look up or memorize. And it comes from doing physical integration. But for a hollow ball, I get a 2 thirds MR squared for the moment of inertia and then I have my angular acceleration around the center of mass. Now we still need to relate the angular acceleration of the ball to the center of mass acceleration. And this comes from looking at the rolling without slipping condition, and I'll post a link to the video where this was derived. 
as it turns out, when something is rolling without slipping, the velocity of the center of mass is equal to r omega, where omega is the angular velocity. We can take a time derivative of this, and we find out the acceleration of the center of mass is related to the angular acceleration by a equals r alpha. This allows us to eliminate alpha from that second equation. Alpha is going to be a center of mass over r. And we're going to plug that into the second equation. And I see one of my r's canceling. And then if I look all the way on the left side of the equation, there's another factor of r that I can cancel. So all the r's are gone now. And my second equation reduces to fs is equal to 2 thirds m times the center of mass acceleration. We'll write that along with the first equation. That was mg sine theta minus fs is equal to mass times the center of mass acceleration. This system is ready to solve by elimination. When I add the two equations, the fs terms are going to cancel. And I get mg sine theta is equal to ma plus 2 thirds ma. And that's 5 thirds mass times acceleration of the center of mass. Now my masses cancel out. And I arrive at a general expression, 3g sine theta over 5, for the center of mass acceleration. And we'll go ahead and plug numbers into that. And I get 3 times 9.8 sine of 25 degrees, that's the angle of incline for the ramp, all divided by 5. And this gives me 2.485, keeping a little extra precision, meters per second squared. In part B, we want the maximum height for the ball before it turns around. And we have the initial speed when it hits the bottom of the ramp, and we have the acceleration. So we should be able to quickly find the distance that it rolls up the ramp. I'm going to call that D. And once we have D, we can use trigonometry to figure out how the height compares to the initial height. And that's going to be a d sine theta. So first, the kinematics part. And this is just one dimensional kinematics. I'm calling the initial position 0. So I get v squared equals v naught squared plus 2a d. My final velocity, if I'm going all the way to the turning point, my final velocity is 0. My initial velocity was 3.5. And now I need to call my acceleration negative, because I'm using up the ramp as positive. I know my acceleration was down the ramp. My acceleration is negative 2.485, and d is my only unknown there. And I get 2.645 meters for that. Then I want that final y-coordinate, so I have d sine theta. So 2.645 sine 25 degrees. Into three sig figs, this gives me 1.04 meters. So there's the final height at the turning point. Finally, I want to figure out the minimum coefficient of static friction, so the ball is not going to slip on the hill. And this just requires us to assume that the static friction force is maxed out in this problem. So we're sitting right at the minimum possible coefficient of static friction to keep this thing rolling without slipping. So the plan is to relate static friction force, the coefficient of static friction, and the normal force, and assume the static friction force is maxed out. And I'll go ahead and just break this into pieces. My static friction force can be obtained from this simplified form of the second equation. That's just 2 thirds m times a center of mass. And I have all these things. So I write 2 thirds. The mass is 0.75. a was 2.485. And I get 1.243 newtons for the static friction force. Then the normal force. This is one of the first things I wrote down in the diagram. That's mg cosine theta. And I get 6.661 newtons for that. And finally, I can get my static friction coefficient by taking that friction force and dividing by the normal force. And I arrive at a static friction coefficient of 0 0.187. And we're done. If you enjoyed this video, or at least found it useful, check out another one by clicking one of the links on the left, or click the Zach's Lab logo on the right to explore dozens of physics and math playlists. As always, you can leave your questions, comments, and requests in the comments section below, and I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Thanks for watching Zach's Lab, and best of luck on your math and physics journey.